would invite you to turn in your scriptures to Joshua chapter 1. Part of the call of Joshua, the promise given to him. We'll read just the first nine verses, Joshua chapter 1. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And we turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 intended for us to look at the first 17 verses, but we'll look at verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11, Acts chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city." And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Amen. You may be seated. One of the most basic rules when we read and study God's word is 
Focus on what the text says, not what you think it might say. Don't read into the text. Read what is there. Now, you might say, well, isn't this obvious? And it should be. It should be a basic principle of interpretation, but I'm sure you've heard many sermons or messages where the one speaking really reads into the passage that which is not stated rather than focusing on on what has been revealed. There's something natural for man to want to see something about the text that's not there. Now, I say this as an introduction to our text from Acts 18 and Paul's ministry and Corinth. We can say it was a difficult ministry, but Luke has not given us a great deal about what Paul thought or felt. Some say Paul was discouraged as he began or as he was in the first part of his ministry in Corinth. That's possible, but the text doesn't say that. Luke has not given us that information. Now, we do see, very importantly, that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Paul in a vision, verses 9 and 10. And this is obviously a central part of this chapter that does give us some indication of the challenge that Paul was facing. And we do have other details than what Luke has given us. We have in First and Second Corinthians important background information. And we Try to put this all together rather than, again, reading something from the text that is not there. Now, it is meaningful to consider Paul's life and ministry after almost 20 years of service to the Lord. By this time, we've reached almost 20 years after Paul's calling, after his mighty conversion. And we think Paul would eventually be the author of about half the books of the New Testament, He was the pioneer missionary and church planner. He was an apostle called dramatically by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he had suffered greatly already at this point in his life. He had been beaten, nearly killed by stoning. Now you might think after 20 years of service, Paul would be in a pretty good position. Things would be going pretty well for Paul. But that's not the description that we have here and Acts or in other parts, but rather Paul had to work to support himself. The funding maybe that had enabled part of his ministry, it had dried up or it was not there. Paul had to work and support himself. His ministry was not getting any easier at this point in his life. And then we also consider the church that Paul was part of that was established by God's grace and Paul's labors. Would you want to be known as the founder of the church in Corinth? Would you ever put on your resume, I was the founding pastor of the church in Corinth? Well, as you read First and Second Corinthians, you realize this was a very troubled church. Now, it's very easy in our own lives. I'm not saying Paul was thinking this, but it's easy for us to say, I should have it better. My life should be better. Look at all I've done for Christ. Look at all my service. Why isn't my life easier or better? Again, I'm not saying this is what Paul was saying, but maybe it's a lesson that we take from this text. It's easy for us to think we should be doing better in our service or or things should be different for us in, in a variety of ways. Well, at the center of Paul's ministry, In Corinth, as Luke has written it, at the center is the vision in verses 9 and 10, and then the conclusion, the application to that vision, verse 11. Whatever Paul was feeling or facing, and that's not been fully revealed to us, but whatever he was feeling, all the challenges that he was enduring, we can say this, he needed the encouragement. He needed the encouragement and the assurance that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to him. At the heart of the vision is what? It's the presence of Christ. I am with you. That is the center of this vision. We might say it's the center of Paul's ministry in Corinth. I am with you. And so this text does remind us it is the presence of Christ that we so need. It's the presence of Christ that is essential for you to know as you carry out the work that God has given to you. Well, our focus will be just on the first part of Acts 18, verses 1 through 11. It's such a beautiful text, such a blessing to study this text. And I would encourage you, spend some time, if you have it, reading 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians as, as we continue our study 
through the book of Acts. There's such a beautiful unity of, of God's word. So we'll be focusing on verses 1 through 11 in two parts. First, the difficult ministry that Paul had in Corinth, verses 1 through 8. And then the vision that Paul was given. The Lord Jesus Christ assures Paul, verses 9 through 11. But let's consider then first verses 1 through 8, this difficult ministry of Paul in Corinth. I ask the question as we begin, where are we in terms of Paul's ministry? Where are we in terms of this second missionary journey? Well, that second missionary journey started at the end of Acts 15. So here we are at the start of chapter 18. This journey lasted from sometime in the year 49 through the year 51. So a little over two years, almost three years. Acts 17 ended with Paul's ministry in Athens. There was fruit from that ministry. At least five, we can say, that were converted. Paul determined it was time to move on. Paul went from the city of Athens. He went west to the city of Corinth. About a 40-mile journey, if you could draw a straight line. 40 to 45 miles. And when you travel from Athens to Corinth west, You'll travel across a part of Greece that's very narrow. It's, it's difficult to describe the country of Greece in terms of its geography, but it has two major sections, and there's a, a narrow section, an isthmus, only about four or five miles across, that connects those two parts of Greece. The one part that goes to the north, then you have that isthmus, and then you have the, the southern part of Greece. And Corinth is right at that isthmus. It's right at a very strategic part of the country, and that is in part why Corinth became a very important city. James Boyce, in his commentary, describes the city of Corinth with three words that begin with the letter C. Three words, cosmopolitan, commercial, and corrupt. Cosmopolitan, commercial, and corrupt. We call it a cosmopolitan city. It was a mixture of races and peoples. Corinth was a seaport. Its work was commerce, and so there were people all from the Roman world that lived there, at least from different times. Corinth was a commercial city known for its trade and business, and a lot of goods would be transported both by ship and by land when they came near Corinth. As I say, there's that isthmus that connects the two parts of Greece, and because Going by ship could be dangerous. Sometimes ships would go on one side of that isthmus, and then slaves would take all the goods, transport it to the other side, and then another boat would carry on those goods as they continued their journey. You say, very inefficient, and yet, again, because of the danger of shipping things, that was a strategy that was employed. Now, later, uh, uh, and a, a canal was built across that narrow isthmus. I guess during the time of Nero, they attempted to build a canal, but it was not successful. So Corinth was cosmopolitan. It was commercial. It was a corrupt city, a wicked city. Now we know Athens was also a very vile city in terms of idolatry, and we might say Corinth also matched it and maybe excelled it in other ways. Corinth was the center of the goddess of Aphrodite or Venus, the goddess of love. And she, or Corinth, had the temple to this pagan goddess, and it was one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world. And so when you read 1 Corinthians, you see this was indeed a wicked city. And I would say maybe it would even make Las Vegas or San Francisco look like they were honorable and upright cities. So when Paul is ministering here, it's not because of the beautiful views, because of the weather. This is a pagan city that needs the gospel. That's why he goes to Corinth. It's not going to be an easy place. In fact, James Boyce said, to be called a Corinthian was an insult if you were not from that city. It was an insult to be called a Corinthian. Now Luke has given us two dates in this chapter, or two ways to date when Paul was in Corinth. And throughout our study of Acts, I've mentioned different dates, uh, some of these coming from the work of Professor Eckerd Schnabel, who's made a very careful study of Paul and the other apostles in the New Testament and their ministries. But there are two events in this chapter that Luke has given. First in verse 2, look at verse 2. Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, and they were kicked out of 
Rome because of the command of the emperor Claudius. Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and this can be dated to the year 49. The year 49. And then verse 14 speaks of a proconsul, that is the governor, the ruler under the Roman Senate of this part of Greece, the province of Achaia. And the, the Gallio was proconsul, we read in verse 12. Now, Gallio was proconsul only for one year, from July 1st, the year 51, through June 30th, the year 52. So from these two historical events, we can say Paul was in Corinth sometime after the year 49, and he had to be there at least during part of the reign of Gallio, who served as proconsul, as I say, from the year 51 through 52. So we can date at least some aspects of, of Paul's ministry fairly precisely. Well, we consider Paul has had several travel companions who still are not with him. Luke probably was left in Philippi. That was the last time we've read of Luke. Silas and Timothy were left in Berea when Paul was taken by believers from Berea and brought to Athens. And so when Paul first got to Corinth, he was alone, we can say. Now in God's providence then, he met a Jewish couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who we note had been forced out of Rome by the emperor Claudius, now, later in the chapter, we see that this couple were believers. They were believers in Jesus Christ. That's not mentioned immediately in the text, but in verse 26, we see that Aquila and Priscilla explain to Apollos the way of God more accurately. And it would be an interesting question, how did they come to saving faith in Rome? Obviously, Paul was not the founder of the church in Rome. He would later visit. He would later write to the Romans, but he was not the founder of the church there. The gospel already had been taken to Rome, and Aquila and Priscilla were converted. And we, when we read Romans and other parts, we realize this was a very godly and brave couple. They also sacrificed for the sake of Christ. And here, in God's perfect timing, they were in Corinth, and they provided Paul a place to live, and they provided Paul help in his work. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11, 9. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 9, Paul, reviewing his situation, says, And when I was present with you and in need, when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. When Paul was first in Corinth, he was in need. And so what did he do? He worked. He supported himself. He didn't live off the Corinthians. Now later, and we'll see in verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came, they brought with them gifts that allowed Paul to carry out his work. But again, think of this point. After many years of serving the Lord, what is the position that Paul was in? You might say he would have found a beautiful villa in Corinth that overlooked the sea. He would have had a, a team with him that was helping him write his next bestseller. The Apostle Paul Ministries would have been going along very well. In fact, they were about to plan a wonderful ministry cruise of the Greek islands. Now, that wasn't Paul's position. Paul was put in a position of need. That's, I think, significant. He had been called by the Lord to preach the gospel to Jews and Gentiles. He wasn't going to give that up, but here Paul found himself in a position where he had to labor with his hands. He had to support himself, providing for his own needs in the city of Corinth. We're not given all the details, but we see verse 3 speaks of Paul and Aquila. I don't think Priscilla had the same trade, but Paul and Aquila were tent makers. That's the translation. It's a very literal translation. There's some question on exactly the meaning of this word. Some would say Paul was a leather worker. 
Paul was a leather worker, someone who made leather tents. That's a, a definite possibility. But for this season in his life, Paul, rather than devote himself full time to his missionary work and, and teaching and evangelism, Paul, for some period, had to work with his own hands. He was a leather worker, a tent maker to support himself. That's the opening part of Acts 18. Now, there's obviously no mention of Paul complaining or being bitter about that. Not at all. He did what he had to do to carry out the work that God had given. Note verse 4. Verse 4 states, He reasoned or he spoke in the synagogue every Sabbath. So he still carried out his normal ministry, but I think that reference to every Sabbath is probably significant. It means during the other part of the week, Paul was working as a leather worker, as a tent maker. He still made time, obviously, to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And look at the end of verse 4. And persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, that may better read, and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. The, the grammar of the verse would say it was not a done deal. It was something ongoing. He's attempting to do this. So we can say, at least at this point, we're not told of the fruit of Paul's ministry. That comes later. But we can say this would have been a very challenging time. He's in a wicked city. He has to support himself, and his time is limited because of his other needs to proclaim the gospel. Then there's a change, starting with verse 5. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now, when you read that, you might say, oh, Paul wasn't doing that before. Was Paul not preaching Jesus as the Christ before that? Only after Silas and Timothy came, he, he changed his message. Well, that would be incorrect. There's some difficulty in the translation of verse 5. I'll just point that out, some textual questions. But here's how we should understand it. The difference is not the message. That would be absurd. The difference is the time and energy that Paul had. When Silas and Timothy came, they brought with them support from Philippi, from other churches in Macedonia. Such that Paul now had the freedom to spend all his time in his ministry. Full time in this evangelistic ministry. And what's the result? It's opposition. That's the first result. Apparently, the unbelieving Jews then in Corinth put up with Paul for a time. Maybe they just saw him once a week. They, they put up with him. Now as he was able to carry out his ministry more full-time, or just as they continued to hear the message that he was bringing, they started to resist or oppose him, and even more, they blasphemed the message of the gospel. So the result, when Paul even more intently focused on preaching the gospel, was opposition. Now, we know that Paul dearly loved his own people. Romans chapter 9 through 11 details Paul's love and zeal for his own people. He wanted nothing more than to see them come to saving faith. That's very clear. But then we also see the boldness of Paul. You can say it's a form of love. When you speak the truth boldly, that is also a form of love. Paul follows the instruction of our Lord, in fact. He shook his garments, we read. What does that mean? It's a sign that I'm breaking fellowship. It's a strong symbolism that Paul gives to them. And then he speaks very boldly to them. Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. You might say it's, it's language coming out of Ezekiel and other parts of the Old Testament. I have done my duty. I've shared the truth with you. So he speaks very boldly. He speaks in a loving way. It's a loving thing to speak the truth boldly. And then Paul says, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That doesn't mean he's not going to try to reach the Jews any longer, but rather he's going to focus on the Gentiles. He's not going to just be in the synagogue there in Corinth. He is going to move on, and that's what we see. Very strategically, then verse 7, he finds a house 
right next door to the synagogue. Now, again, we love to have some of the other details, but what a providence of God. He's forced out of the synagogue, or he chooses to leave, and he strategically opens shop right next door to the synagogue. A man by the name of Justice. Now, we don't know a great deal about this man other than he is called there in verse 7, one who worshiped God. That is, he used to be part of the synagogue. He was a Gentile, but a one who worshiped God or a God fear. That's a sort of a technical term. For Gentiles who attended the regular services of the synagogue, they did not become full converts, but they did worship God. And so Justice is a Gentile. Now, some believe that this justice is also the same person named Gaius. Gaius. Why would some conclude that? Well, based on what we read in Romans and 1 Corinthians. Romans 16, verse 23. Remember, Paul writes the book of Romans from Corinth. It's written later on. But Paul writes Romans from Corinth, and in Romans 16, 23, we read this. Gaius, my host. Gaius, my host, and of the whole church greets you. Doesn't that seem to indicate that maybe this justice is Gaius? It's possible. We can't be dogmatic. It's possible. And then in 1 Corinthians 1.14, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Well, Crispus is mentioned in verse 8. But Gaius is not mentioned here in Acts 18. So some think, well, maybe this justice is the same individual. People could have a variety of names, so it's possible. So we have Justice, who opens his home to Paul. He's obviously been converted. And then amazingly, the ruler of the synagogue, the one who's in charge of the services. Sometimes there could be more than one ruler, but still, this is a very important position. Later, we'll read about another ruler of the synagogue that's converted, named Sosthenes, but here it's Crispus, Crispus and his household believe on the Lord. So even though Paul leaves the synagogue, there is still fruit from both Jews and Gentiles. And then the end of verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. The question is, what are they hearing? It's not told Immediately, we can say they're hearing the gospel, they're hearing the fruit of what's going on. The Lord, in his perfect timing, brings an incredible harvest. Now listen, if you would, to the testimony that we find in 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2. We might mistakenly read this chapter. That's the importance of of reading Scripture with Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Verse 3. Note that. When Paul was in Corinth, He was there in weakness that may refer to physical ailments that he suffered. And we know that Paul had different problems. When you saw Paul, you saw a man that was weak. I think sometimes we have these misinterpretations. Obviously, he spoke boldly. But you would not think of Paul as this mighty man. You would say, no, that person's weak, despised. He says he was there in fear and in trembling. Now, we'll note this more as we look at the vision, but that should also encourage us when we think of the duty that God has given us. And there are things he calls us to do, and we tremble in the face of them. There's a fear. There's not a joy always in our service. Paul says, that was how I was with you. And yet, then verse 4, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. It's through the Holy Spirit that he brings the word, verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Isn't that a beautiful testimony to the way we are 
to carry out our work. It's not about our own strength. It's not about how articulate we are, our excellence of speech. No, it's about proclaiming the word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord, in this case, brought incredible fruit to Paul who faced a very challenging ministry that would continue. This is not the end of the challenge. It's in the midst of the challenge then that we have this vision, verses 9 through 11. We can say at a very key moment in Paul's ministry, as the gospel is going into new areas, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to Paul in a vision. Now, there are six visions that Paul received in the book of Acts. So this is not, obviously, the only one. This is the third of six visions. And we can say every vision the Lord gave at a very key time. It's not that Paul is constantly having these visions. They come at key moments in his ministry. And we can say it's not just about Paul. It's about the spread of the gospel that he's given these important visions. Now we read, The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Howard Marshall notes the introduction to this vision is significant. Paul's vision comes from whom? It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It, and it's significant that the way the message is described reminds us of how God would also speak to his servants in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. So the Lord Jesus comes to Paul in the night through a vision. It's a supernatural form of revelation that Jesus gave to Paul. And there are five parts to this nighttime vision. Let's consider them. It begins with, do not be afraid. You maybe know the Greek word for fear is phobos, or the, the verb phobu. Do not fear. Just two words. Paul don't be afraid. The same words are used in Acts 27 and verse 24. Now, was Paul afraid? Well, at least in terms of 1 Corinthians, he said he was there in fear. When it says, don't be afraid, I don't think we conclude, oh, Paul was just filled with terror. But we can say this, he needed to be encouraged not to fear. There's a difference. When Joshua is told, be of good courage, it doesn't mean he lacked courage, but no, he needed to be reminded of these things. Paul had to be reminded, don't be afraid, Paul. And that, again, should encourage us as we see the work, the calling that God has given to us. We may well be tempted to be filled with fear. Don't be filled with fear. Don't be controlled by fear. Second, speak and do not be silent. We might again ask the question, was Paul tempted to stop his ministry? Was he tempted to just to be silent? What was he going to do if he remained silent again? We're not told that, that Paul was tempted to do that, but he might have been tempted to ask the question, what is the point to this? He might have been tempted to say, maybe I need to move on. But he's told by the Lord, no, faithfully proclaim the word of God. Faithfully continue your ministry. Now, we are tempted often to be silent, to not speak, or we're tempted to engage in other methods or gimmicks. Paul is told, no, focus on the faithful preaching of the word of God, of the message of the gospel. Now, undoubtedly, we can say Paul, as an apostle, was blessed and used in ways that are not repeatable, right? Paul has a place, we can say, in redemptive history that we're not going to say, oh, my life is going to be just like that. That would be foolish. But there is another thing to consider. Paul was obedient. So on one hand, we say, yes, we're not apostles. We're not going to be given that same calling. On the other hand, Paul labored. We might say, our lack of fruit isn't just because we're not apostles, Sometimes our own lack of fruit is we don't labor. We don't obey, as Paul did, as, as others did. So speak and do not be silent. And then the heart of this vision, I am with you. I am with you. And this promise is really the heart of Scripture, isn't it? The promise 
of God's presence. And why does it have to be said? Because we're tempted to not realize it. We don't see Christ with us. We don't feel Christ with us. And so the promise is given. If you are in Christ, it's not that you have a wonderful hope and salvation. The promise is, I am with you. Paul later, when he blesses the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The same basic language. The God of love and peace will be with you. What's the last promise that Jesus gives to his disciples in Matthew? At least in Matthew's accounting. The last promise is what? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the promise that Christ gives to us. Not that you're going to have a great life, everything is going to be successful. No, the promise is I am with you. We sang earlier from Psalm 91. It's a wonderful psalm of God's protection and promise. And I think there's a way to take those psalms or promises and and misuse them. As if, if you have enough faith, you'll never get sick. If you have enough faith, you'll never get into an accident. If you have enough faith, all will go well. That's not the meaning of those promises. Rather, they, they do have an old covenant significance. God did do things that, in some sense, were miraculous for his people that that don't all get taken over to the new covenant point by point. But at the heart of all those promises in the old covenant is God's presence with his people. And I think that's what we find then throughout the new covenant. Not that all will go well if you have enough faith. It's God is with you. That's the hope and assurance that we are to have. James Boyce wrote this, Do you ever find yourself trying to be a witness in your office? Live morally when faced with temptation or whatever you think God wants you to do and have so much trouble that you begin to think, is God really with me? Is it worth it? Should I just give up? If so, you need to hear what God said to Paul. Well, Paul's given two other promises here. Number four, no one will attack you to hurt you. Now, this is not a promise that is given in the same way to every believer. And this was not going to be the case for Paul always for the rest of his ministry. But for his time in Corinth, he was reminded, Paul, even though you are in a very dangerous city, no one is going to be able to harm you or hurt you. The Jews would continue to attempt to do so, as we'll see, starting in verse 12. They tried to stop Paul's ministry. They wanted him arrested, imprisoned, killed as a rebel, but they would not be successful. The Lord gave, amazingly, Paul the freedom that he needed to proclaim the gospel. And then number five, for I have many people in this city. The fruit Paul already had seen that was not the end. The Lord promised a special fruit that would come from Corinth. That was not the promise given in Athens or everywhere where Paul went, but it was the promise here. Paul would continue to labor and stay in the city of Corinth and his labor would not be in vain. There would be many others who would come to an understanding of the gospel. And so what is the result? We see in verse 11, Paul stayed in Corinth a year and six months. Now, that stands out, doesn't it? When you read about Paul's ministry in Athens, we're not told how long he was there. Same thing for Thessalonica or Berea or Philippi. But here, a year and six months, 18 months. And up to this point, this is the longest by far, we can say. This is the longest that Paul stayed in any city. Why did he stay that long? It wasn't because he liked the weather, he liked the view from his window. No, this was a difficult place to minister, but there was fruit that would come from his ministry. Because it was difficult, he stayed there this long. There was a need for the faithful preaching. And notice, what is Paul doing? He's teaching the Word of God among them. It's, we might say it's part evangelism, And it is part instruction. 
of the believers and saints already in Corinth. He needed to stay there. And when you read 1 Corinthians, you realize why. This was a troubled congregation, but that should also encourage us, shouldn't it? Well, let me give two final conclusions from this chapter. First, the subject of full-time ministry. Maybe you've heard that word, full-time ministry. Here's the point I want to make. Every believer is part of a full-time ministry, or should be. Right? Every Christian is called to full-time Christian service. That was true of Paul, even when he was a tent maker. He was still in full-time Christian service. And that should be true for every believer. Doesn't mean you become a missionary or a pastor or a teacher. No, every believer is full-time in Christian service. That should be our view because every believer has the same calling, to be a witness, to seek the advancement of Christ's kingdom. Notice what Paul then writes to the Corinthians at the end of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's not writing that about his own labor. He's writing that to the Corinthians. They were not all missionaries and pastors and teachers. They were of people of different trades, different industries, and yet Paul tells them, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And there, I don't think he's just talking about their normal job. He's talking about the spiritual labor that includes the work they have been given. Do you see that your life also, no matter what your calling is, your life is to be full-time in Christian service. And again, we've talked about this many times coming out of the Reformation. That division between the sacred and the secular in this respect needs to be broken down because every believer, even though we have different callings, every believer is to be in full-time Christian service. So we should not just think it's for some who are in the church, the pastor or others, oh, they are in full-time where I'm not. No, every believer, every faithful believer is to be. And so we need to see every day we get up, that's part of our service to our King. And we need to see there's different ways that we serve. Do you see your prayer as part of your service? Do you see witnessing, as giving other ways as, as part of your service? Do you see even the job that God has given you that's part of your service to the Lord? And you bring a witness to Him that's part of His, your calling full-time Christian service. Well, second, let's focus then or reflect again on this vision and the presence of Christ. We would say, I would love for God to give me a vision. Well, maybe you need to get your eyes checked to to read the Bible. That's the vision. Paul didn't have the blessing that we have. Think of that. There's one way where we have a blessing that Paul never enjoyed. We have the fullness of God's Word. He had, of course, the Old Covenant Scriptures. He wrote about half the books of the New Testament, but he never had a final copy of the Scriptures. And so we understand God did give Paul visions. He needed those visions, and we would love to say, oh, Lord, give me a vision. Well, read the Word of God. That's the vision. That's what you need. And we need to be reminded daily, then, of the presence of Christ. Now, I don't think it comes only through the Word of God. I think that sense of God's presence. We also know that when we are in prayer. That sense of God's presence should be in other spiritual blessings that we receive. Sometimes it's through good fellowship, encouragement, spiritual conversations that we have with other believers that the Lord can use in our own lives and in the lives of those that we speak. It's part of the Lord's Supper. Right? The presence of Christ with us. It, in one way, it's so basic. So elementary, and yet we often don't seek that assurance, do we? Sometimes we seek other encouragements. We want the Lord to bless this and that, and those things are fine, but do we pray, Lord, remind me of your presence. Assure me of your presence with me. Isn't that the wonderful truth of Psalm 23? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that psalm all about God's presence with David 
and his trust. So that's what we need to be reminded of and assured of, the presence of the sovereign God, the presence of Jesus Christ. That is essential so that you will carry out the work that God has given to you. Let's pray.